welcome all our viewers in the United States and around the world. Welcome to another episode of The Talk. I'm James Pierre, very excited to bring you top-notch guest and there's no better, no better person to do that. Someone from Miami now making it around the world. Dr. Jack, thank yes. you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Man, from Miami now to Harvard. Yes. Before we even <laughs> go there, let's talk about your... Why don't we talk about sports? I think it would be best. <laughs> Let's go. LeBron or Kobe Bryant? Oh, Kobe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, you know, I got closer with my brother uh -huh. watching Kobe play because, you know, we were Orlando Magic fans. Mm -hmm. And when Shaq went to L.A., yeah. um, that switched. connection to then we followed Shaq, but then the love and appreciation we have for both of them playing together and then the continued love for Kobe. Um, I think, you know, there are five players in, in, in the NBA who I think are changed the face of the NBA in different ways. It, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Yao Ming. Because the way in which those last two, also three, mm -hmm. um, opened, the NBA, opened the world to the NBA and opened the NBA to the world, you know, something the whole continent, of Africa, yeah. Asia, like it was just something special and we need to make sure that their impact is just, will, will, will never be truly measured. And so, yeah. and with Kobe, uh, I mean, he was the mo one of the most clutch players you will ever see in the NBA. So, it's yeah. Kobe. <laughs> okay, so, fair enough. Tupac or Biggie? Man, choosing between <laughs> goats. Um... <laughs> To be honest with you, I would probably choose Biggie. Okay. Yeah. Which surprises, yeah. which, which surprises people, but uh, Life After Death is probably one of my favorite, yeah. one of my favorite albums. So <laughs> many hits, so <laughs> many hits. <laughs> favorite spot in Miami, uh, obviously Miami's home to you. You know, uh, one of my favorite spots, because so many memories, I still love going to Bird Bowl. Yeah. I love going bowling here in Miami, oh man. Because we used to go to subs, et cetera, uh -huh. and drive up Burt Road, go to subs, et cetera, and then go bowling. I still know the number to, the, to, the, to that restaurant. Because the best, best, bur uh, best um, triple cheeseburger sub you'll ever have in your life. And their chef salad, absolutely phenomenal. So I, um, that's actually one thing I love about going to Miami now is that now I come back to Miami with more resources than mm -hmm. I did when I was growing up. So now I get to take my family out to places. So like we'll go to Havana Harry's, we'll go to... Um, when will it, we'll go to different spots at least one time whenever I'm home so that we can see how Miami is changing because now we're able to see Miami in a different sort of way. I'm glad you say now you have more resources going back to Miami because throughout your book as well, you talk about not having enough resources. Mm -hmm. Take me back to your childhood as the black boy living in Miami. Um, you know, it's funny. I have a stronger class identity sometimes mm -hmm. because... Growing up, when you have to manage scarce resources, thinking about what you identify as or the plight of that group becomes secondary. Mm -hmm. When you are worrying about if you would have enough to eat or, the, or enough school supplies um, to, to go to school with, those things monopolize your attention. And so for me, Miami growing up was about managing scarcity. It was about making sure that I saved enough to make sure that we had what we need, and then like penny pinch like crazy to go to the movies or go bowling. Um, I still remember, you know, um, I don't know if, if you remember this, but when we got our report cards in uh, elementary and middle yeah. school, there was sometimes little one free game of bowling at Bird Bowl. <laughs> and we would go to those things, yeah. and that was just, it was, it, was, it was fun, it was amazing, and that's how we made do. Um, I don't know Miami in the social scene like many of the people who vacation here. Miami for me is, is playing spades on the park. It's going bowling. It's um, playing dominoes with family. Um, it's more barbecues than, you know, rolling up and down the boulevard. And so I like coming home because Miami is that sense of peace for me, that place of peace um, that I can then elect to go into and do different things with. We always love to have you back here in yeah. Miami, again, sharing more resources with your community mm -hmm. as well. Take me back to your first trip 
Uh, I know airplane wasn't <laughs> also part of it. <laughs> oh, man. My, so the story that many people don't know is I share in the book that my first time ever on an airplane mm -hmm. was when I flew from Fort Lauderdale Airport to, uh, to Bradley for my Amherst College recruitment trip. Mm -hmm. What people don't know <laughs> is I almost didn't get on my connecting flight in Atlanta because when I got off, CNN had this ball of fire in the sky, a spaceship had blew up on reentry. Uh -huh. I called the dean, I called my mom, I'm not getting on anything that flies. There's no way, I'm saying if a spaceship can't make it back to Earth, uh -huh. there's no way I'm getting on a plane. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just, the thing is, vacations growing up were driving to a cousin's house in Georgia. Mm. That's what they consisted of. Yeah. And we would drive up 95, you know, go on 321, go to my Aunt Ethan's house or go to a cousin's house. That's what vacations yeah. were for us. They weren't going abroad. They weren't, you know, going to somebody's second home. Um, but that doesn't mean that my summers weren't fun. Like, I am a very park kid to the day I die. So from Miami now to, you know, you talk about Coconut Grove has yeah. changed tremendously. Yes. Right? So uh, what is that telling you? I mean, Miami, I, I, I drove on 95. Uh, you know, when 95 changes to US 1, mm -hmm. I didn't even recognize it. Wow. I mean, you used to be able to see out, mm -hmm. and now you just see buildings. Um, I mean, you have both just development, that you, but you also have gentrification. Yeah. And so many people are being priced out, but also so many people are being invited in. It's like this, this tug of war about who gets to stay. Coconut Grove looks nothing like what I grew up. I call it like a half-remembered dream. Because what's interesting is Coconut Grove looks nothing like what I experienced growing up, but they look like the people who I go to school with. They have the same degrees. They have the same type of jobs. They have this. And so interesting where I'm, I'm like in this moment, like what, which one is the reality, the Coconut Grove of past or future? Yeah. Um, Miami looks, yeah, Miami looks very different. And, and sometimes I just walk around, like I would walk from the house, where my, I used to live on Percival Avenue, and walk to Coca Walk. And I will take just different streets on purpose just to see just how many of these condos are being built, how many of the new developments and, and what houses are no longer there and seeing if I can even remember who lived there. Yeah. And sometimes I can't. I, I can't remember exactly which house. And so and now even Google Maps being updated, I can't even tell what houses were there five or six years ago. You talk about in a book not having a fair shot economically, mm -hmm. uh, gentrification in many places in South Florida. Yeah. I have to ask you, what is that telling you? It's a symptom of a much larger, I mean, it's a, it's a symptom of, of, of income inequality in the country mm -hmm. and the lack of protections that we have for, um, um, for our most, if not disadvantaged, at least um, those who are not as financially secure. Um, I think it is going to change the very culture and nature of a place. I mean, look what happened in D.C. Mm -hmm. when um, um, people moved into a place near Howard and then one person was like, y'all play music too loud, mm -hmm. um, move the university. Mm -hmm. That kind of entitlement to dictate whose culture matters. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that Miami is able to retain many different aspects of its culture, right? Because we have the culture of the Caribbean, we have the culture of uh, and also many, many countries from the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. We have the culture of, um, yes, Georgia and South Carolina, like with, within the Grove, you have Haiti, you have Cuba, you have even Puerto Rico, you have Jamaica, you have a whole bunch of cultures here. And I hope that that still gets celebrated, but that the social class, like how much money you need to be able to experience it, be a part of it, I hope that that does not, does not stifle it. Nicely said. Wonderful conversation with Dr. Abraham Jack. We'll be right back after the commercial break. More importantly, we'll talk education. Stay with us. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. 
Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back to our second segment, wonderful conversation with uh, Dr. Anthony Abraham Jack, uh, someone from Miami, living in Miami, maybe not in Miami all day, all night, but Miami still lives inside of him, and that's why we call you the best person in Miami. <laughs> Will that be fair enough, right? Although you go for... Kobe Bryant, not Dwayne Wade, right? <laughs> Dwayne Wade. No, I love, no, I, I love my city. Yeah. Um, you know, I, so, I mean, just the, just the memories of the choice to whether to stay or whether to leave. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to go to, I mean, my Friday nights were at either, um, uh, uh, oh my God, what, uh, Tropical Park. That's oh! Because that's where Gables played. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We played our, all of our home games at Tropical Stadium. Um, I actually played my last game for Gables at Trash Pile Stadium. Mm -hmm. And so, so many memories of, of this city and so many connections. I, it's funny, mm -hmm. I actually ran into, um, I ran into Frank Gore in the airport. We, we, you know, we lived in the Grove together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the only thing I hear, I was walking in the airport, Big Jack. <laughs> and I, was, I look around and it's Frank. He was um, coming from, uh, you know, because he played for Buffalo now. Yeah, uh -huh. um, and just like so many memories of people who I played football with, who wow. I went to school with, still connections to this wow. day. It's just, it's amazing. Man, that is good. That is good. You talk in your book as well about public school and private school, yeah. the disparity. You went to public school. Yeah. Tell me more about your point of view on that and also your experience going to public school. Yeah. So I'm a Head Start kid. Um, I went from public school from, you know, from pre-K all the way to my 11th grade year. And then I switched to a private school, Gulliver Prep, mm -hmm. um, here in Miami. So I went, to Coral, you know, I went to Coconut Grove Elementary, George Washington Carver Middle, wow. and Coral Gables Senior High School. Actually, my class ring is still from Gables. I didn't, I didn't change it because wow. Gables has my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Gulliver Prep for one year, and I had absolutely an amazing experience there. But one thing that it taught me was just how drastically different the funding is from not just a good public and a bad public or mm -hmm. suburban and urban, but just the differences between going to a public school and a private school. You know, I went, my, my smallest class at Gulliver, my largest class was 16 students. My largest. Largest. <laughs> my smallest class at Gables was IB Theory of Knowledge, International Baccalaureate Theory of Knowledge, and even that had 25, 27 students in it. And, that's, and, and, and I mentioned that student-teacher ratio as just an example of the drastic differences in, in funding, resources, opportunities to connect with faculty members mm -hmm. and different things like that. Um, I mean, Gables did, Gables did a great job. I was in an international baccalaureate program. Mm -hmm. I took AP um, advanced placement classes. And I had some really good friends. Um, we, we felt supported, but you can also, but I saw just how differently um, teachers had time when mm -hmm. I switched to, to public, from public to private. And it wasn't because they weren't willing. It was just that the teaching load and the number of students per class was just so drastically different. And so, you know, as a sociologist right now, right, I got my PhD from Harvard University in sociology, you know, I think about the structural inequalities. And in America, there's a $23 billion difference between school systems that are predominantly white and predominantly non-white. When you think about the level of investment in that, right, um, you add race to it and that number just becomes even more, yeah. you know, even more unequal when you add race and social class. When I switched to Gulliver, it was like entering a new world, right? It was like entering a place where, and it wasn't because the type of cars that were in mm. the parking lot, the Mercedes, the Range Rovers. It wasn't the... It was the fact that this, this, this school had a, you know, dedicated computer labs that were not attached to the library. They had dedicated resources where the field was pristine. They had a pool. They had you know, convocation. They had things that, that resembled more a college. Mm -hmm. And Gulliver really does resemble more of a college than a high school. And not just in looks, but in also how teachers taught. Mm -hmm. They had office hours, right? Wow. Right, most public school students have never heard the term office hours, a time when faculty set aside moments to, to talk yeah. to them. 
Gulliver had office hours every single day, one hour after school, where teachers made themselves available. I learned how to navigate office hours in that one year, and it became invaluable in how I navigated um, college for the next four years, let alone graduate school. You talked about languages in your book as mm -hmm. well, different languages. Yeah. You know, um, you're poor, you speak a language. You're rich, you mm -hmm. speak a language. You behave a different way. Educational level, you know, that inside of a school, there's mm -hmm. another language. By not knowing that language, most yeah. of the time, African Americans are considered a victim of that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about that language. I would say there's a hidden curriculum on college campuses, mm -hmm. right? There's a system of unwritten rules and unset expectations. When you get to college, you are expected to have already practiced let alone mastered certain mm -hmm. skills, certain vocabulary um, to navigate the institution. Office hours is just one, is one example. Mm -hmm. um, as I, 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 I joke that fellowship is another, <laughs> right? To some people, fellowship always means church or meal. Mm -hmm. When you get to college, it means church, meal, and a scholarship to go to another university or to uh, opportunity to explore the world, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that people have different languages. It's just that certain, certain experiences give you a more expansive vocabulary to be able to navigate certain institutions. The problem is when we expect all of our students to have a certain language that only if you grew up middle class or up middle class or around the college campuses do you know. And that's why I want to push universities to be more intentional in how they welcome students. Because it's one thing to give students an admission letter. It's another thing to make them feel that they are included as being part and a full citizen of the school because of, this, uh, because of these barriers. Mm -hmm. And language is a big one. And that's why I also push college and universities to reach out to family, right, of the students they admit, to make sure that families and students know what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. And being intentional about, making, uh, uh, about what those things are so that you are not... Um, you're, you're, you're not leaving certain students out um, because of miscommunication. Like, let's be intentional about it. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because also in the book you talk about it's not all the time who you know and what you know. Mm. Sometimes it's who knows about you yes. as well. Yeah. Right? Office hours are not just about asking questions about the material. Mm. Office hours are how, do you, how does a professor think? Can that professor be your support network when times get rough? Can they write you the true currency of the realm, a letter of recommendation, mm -hmm. right? That's gonna to speak to who you are as a person and your skill set. Because like you said, it's not just what you know and who you know, it's who knows you and how well they do. Mm -hmm. And when you have someone like myself, who's a professor, who knows you, who knows your interests, right? Mm -hmm. Your interest in journalism. If I know that a New York Times reporter is coming to campus and I'm having a private dinner with her, because that's sometimes what I get opportunity to do. I might drop your name. I might introduce you if they're mm -hmm. coming to my class. If I, know, if I know something about you, like those are the moments that connections are made and opportunities for adventures well beyond your imagination could be possible. And that's why office hours are an avenue through which people can achieve things that are beyond what, what they know. You said do not do the work that people get paid for. Yes. Let them do the job, yes. right? So they're supposed to go to the resources. They are resources. They are people paid in school to Absolutely. help you in that. There is no harm in asking for help. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not a weakness. Mm. Right? Asking for help is how you get what you need, how you get a little bit of what you want, and how to secure things that are even beyond, again, your imagination. If you need help, if you're at a school that has a, that has that, and you say you want to go, for example, today and you want to transfer to a four-year institution after, after some time, mm -hmm. don't go alone. Don't go it alone. There are people who work in offices specifically geared towards helping students transfer to four-year institutions. Tag that person as part of your support network so that you are not reinventing the wheel every single time. You are inheriting someone else's knowledge and that then you can then use to shepherd your own pathway through. That's important. Don't do the job of somebody else. Don't do the job of somebody else, especially if they get paid for. Dr. Jack, stay with us. We're gonna take a last commercial break. When we come back, why Dr. Jack doesn't have so many friends anymore? We'll tell you why. <laughs> stay with us. <laughs> Thank you. 
Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back to the talk. I'm James Pierre. This is the last segment with the one and only Dr. Anthony Abraham Jack, Harvard professor. Thank you so much for staying with us. Yeah. Now, we'll talk about things that make you a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. They say more you know, less friends you have. Mm. You know, you have a, uh, an associate, you start losing friends. You have a bachelor degree, mm. they don't think the same as you. You have a master's and then you have a, a PhD. It's different. Uh, you mentioned also you, 35, I mean, in the 30s, uh, mm. having a PhD, black in America, never been in jail. So when you're adding all these layers, mm -hmm. you start seeing that, hey, there are not many right. like me. And then people start yeah. disappearing. I would say you do begin to have a different relationship with people that you grew up with. So even if the number of friends you have remain the same, mm -hmm. the, uh, the composition of home friends becomes smaller and smaller. Um, so I'm really only close with one, maybe two friends from home um, with this, with this the trajectory that I have been on. Uh -huh. It's a very different experience and not everybody understands it. And so there are some people who, you know, when I went to Gulliver, they say, oh, you're a sellout. Or uh, when I went to Amherst, like, oh, you're, you know, you're leaving, all that kind of stuff like that. And they don't keep in touch in the same way. And uh, even some family members don't quite mm -hmm. understand, but as a mentor told me, he was like, sometimes you have to forgive people for not understanding the trajectory, that you're, the trajectory they're on, mm -hmm. even if they were the people who worked their butt off to let you get to the places to take those opportunities, right? Because they're responding to the process, not you. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, many of our family members and many of my friends had never gone on to a private school, let alone gone out of state for, out of state for college. They didn't have the same understanding of my college process as theirs. Um, and so like, you, lo you lose contact with people. Now, I still have roughly the same number of friends. The thing is, my friends from Amherst College are a bigger share of my friend group, and then the people who I met at Harvard are, again, a bigger share, let alone people who I met as a sociologist. So my number of friends are the same, but, but, but it is true that a number of friends from Miami, who I see regularly, um, who I connect with, um, mm. is a much smaller share than I would than I would like. Um, but at the same time, um, it's good to it's, it's 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 good to just meet people in general. And so I'm just um, sometimes you have to come to terms with the fact that not everyone that not everyone is going to be around for in your life forever. Mm. And that's something that was hard to deal with. Um, but it gets easier with time. And, and also, you kind of learn, not necessarily who your true friends are, um, but who are, you, who are your friends who can truly support you? Because mm -hmm. there's one thing to have someone in your life who's just a friend, but a friend who can support you, those sometimes mm -hmm. are two different people. Having uh, the support system, also understanding, as you said, yeah. someone being able to communicate with you, yeah. someone that can elevate you to be better. Now, mm -hmm. what you said earlier is also true. The percentage of people of color in my life um, who also have PhDs, who also, that, that number is low, period. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a much more, I would say, diverse group of friends um, from different walks of life um, right now than I've ever, than I've ever, I've ever had. Yeah. I seek out different kind of communities because I like going into different, uh, having different experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but also I live in Boston where it's a, very segregated yeah. city. Um, I actually live in Cambridge, and it's, Cambridge has some diversity, but it's not the same as like what we did, what we yeah. have in Miami. So you, um, yeah, you learn to find out the com yeah. find the community that you need to support yourself. And I'm all about that investing in oneself. Mm. And there are things that I like about my life that I have access to. Like I don't, you know, I've never been a person who went to clubs a lot, mm. but I love going to plays, concerts. 
um, and different. I went, I went to go see Hamilton. I saw Waitress and all those things like that. Um, you know, my, one of my dreams is actually to come back home to go to the uh, to go to the um, the Adrian Art Center. Uh-huh. I want to go see a show there. I would love to take my family to go see um, Alvin Ailey there. I yeah. surprised them with tickets one time, but I didn't mm-hmm. able to get to go. And I want to go to the museums here. And so I'm exploring the things that I love in a brand yeah. new place that is Miami. Because now Miami has those scenes and those things in a way that they didn't have when I was growing up. Mm. You talk about privilege. Mm-hmm. You know, a popular journal mentioning different names, <laughs> different colors. Like, no, this is privilege. Yeah. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Privilege uh, when it comes to race. Yeah. Black or white communities. Uh-huh. There are certain things that you know, the white community has that the black community mm-hmm. doesn't have. How do you think that works uh, and how uh, an African-American student mm. can understand that language we talk about. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I mean, this is a country that's built on inequality, right? The fact that, to this day, um, a black family that makes $100,000 lives in as disadvantage of a neighborhood as a white family that makes $30,000, right? That's three times as much more, much money to live in exactly the same type of neighborhood. We are still living with the legacy of blockbusting and redlining the way in which real estate agents would sell only certain places to black people to keep it segregated or to make money off a white flight. We are still living with the um, consequences of of the racism that was built into the GI Bill and FHA loans that built the middle class in America that black people were not able to access. There are certain things that is not just making certain things accessible, like we actually need to tell the truth, right? Like, you know, there's a great book, When Affirmative Action Was White. Mm-hmm. Right, because a lot of the program, the, a lot of the programs, government programs that created the middle class, that created the suburbs in America, were only accessible for whites. Right, so those are the things. It's not just like s- trying to say it in a certain way. It's literally about making sure that we know the history of exclusion in America, and it's not just with blacks. Right, the way in which Latinx population and Asian population have also been discriminated against in, in po- from from policy. That's why Ibram Kendi, um, who's an uh, amazing American, um, his, uh, 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 American historian, says this about thinking about it. We don't need race-neutral policies. We need anti-racist policies. Because race-neutral just perpetuates the status quo. And if the status quo was already shaped by Jim Crow, by the exclusion in, the, in, in, in FHA loans, like how do you get a housing loan? Mm-hmm. You can literally discriminate against black people and not re- no repercussions. We don't need policies that will continue that status quo. We need policies that will disrupt it. So I grew up in a household where certain words you can't say. You know, same thing for uh, Latin community as uh-huh. well. Uh, what was the word uh, in your house that it was prohibited? You cannot say that as a child. I'm trying to figure out if we, you know, oh yeah, we couldn't say lie. <laughs> oh, right, that was one of the ones that was like, don't say lie, liar. Like he failed when he told the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I will say that's not you, but you are not <laughs> lying. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Cool. Anthony thank Jack, for being me. with us. It was so much fun. Thank you so much, you guys, for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>